While we wait for Apple's shiny new MacBook Pros, we're looking at the Apple Watch Series 7. It gets a fancy new display with teeny tiny bezels and... wait, that's basically it? They announced this thing without a release date, which means it likely wasn't ready in time for the big iPhone keynote. Something doesn't make sense. But we were so curious about the delay that we called in some backup for this teardown. Everyone welcome our good friend and ex-Apple engineer, Tobias. Hello, thanks for having me, Taylor. It's great to have you. He's now working at Instrumental, where they help electronics brands accelerate the development of new products and avoid delays, like the delays that might have kept this Apple Watch from being released with the iPhones. Some of you might remember Tobias from the iPhone 13 livestream, but for those who don't, Tobias, why don't you give us a quick 30-second intro? Thank you. So I'm Tobias. I'm a mechanical engineer. I did product design back at Apple for about six years. And now at Instrumental, we've helped ship 7 million new products across some of the top electronic brands, collected 80 million data points uh, from these products. And we've seen the the full gamut of issues that cause these types of delays. And we've built this platform specifically designed to prevent these type of delays. So we've been teasing Tobias and his instrumental friends all weekend with footage and clips from our Apple Watch teardown. But now that he's here, I'm going to walk him through step by step sort of what we did and get his reaction and then see if together we can't figure out what made this Apple Watch come out so late. And what better way to start than with x-rays from Creative Electron? This 360 spin is looking pretty similar to last year's Series 6 X-Ray, but are you seeing anything, Tobias? I love being able to, to reveal the mystery with the X-Ray, but the, the big building blocks, they really look the same as last year. I'm really excited to, to dive deeper in the display and see what's going on there. So, Tobias, in the past, we have used a razor blade to open these up, but this year I wanted to try something different. So we put it on our heat mat and left it there for a little while, and then we used a suction cup to pull it apart, and it actually worked really well. Yeah, so you're actually on the right track here. There's a few keys when it comes to opening up these types of devices. Uh, heat and suction mm-hmm. are really the two components. Makes sense. The things to keep in mind, uh, I'd say four key components. One, like you have, is fixturing the device from the band slots to mm-hmm. hold it in place. Two is applying the heat You've got a pad across the whole device. Ideally, you want localized heat right around the display edges so you're not damaging anything else. And I'm sure Apple has a device that does just that, right? You can you can design one if you really want it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the last one is actually when you're removing the display to make sure it only pops off X number of millimeters yes. so you don't rip off all those display cables. Yes. So the Series 7's main feature is a bigger display. Can you tell me about maybe how that might have been hard for them to make or pull off? Yeah, well, when we first broached this topic, my immediate suspicion was that the display was at the root cause of some of these delays. Uh, Historically, the display is one of the most complex, both assembly processes and supply chains. Yeah. Extremely delicate and susceptible to damage, either during the assembly or a drop event. Uh, or other shock event. Yeah. And so with the Series 7, what they've done is increase the display size and shrink the bezels. Do you know if, I mean, obviously shrinking bezels is a difficult task. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think if we look at the back of the displays here between the Series 6 and the Series 7, there's a few immediate differences that you'll notice. Looking at the back of the display the border size is typically constrained by both the touch flex exiting out the top and wrapping around, and then the OLED flex bending around at the bottom. And what you can see on the new Series 7 is they've removed the touch flex on the top and consolidated both the touch and the display signals down at the bottom. Ah, I see. So this is similar to what we saw on the iPhone 13 Pro, where it's now integrated together. And lastly, they've added on this plastic frame that helps with structural support and allows them to actually shrink the borders down to this new narrower size. And because of the inherent complexities in the display supply chains, combined with this radically new display design, Mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain that this was the cause of the Apple Watch delays. So in on a design team, when you have a deadline like this and you're trying to get the product out, 
and you are radically changing the design of this component, what are some things that you do to overcome a challenge like that where you have a deadline, but you're doing so many of these changes? Yeah, typically it's a very manual, brute forced trial and error process. Design teams will iterate, they'll evaluate new designs, build them, see how they perform. Mm -hmm. It's extremely time consuming, wastes a lot of man hours as well as materials. Because they're throwing away every single device that fails or every iteration that fails, right? Yeah, it's, it's extremely time inefficient. Yeah. And teams now that are using instrumental are able to better leverage the data of the devices that they're already building to make faster decisions, um, fix problems faster, and ultimately avoid delays like these. Cool. Nice little instrumental plug there. <laughs> yeah. All right, back to disassembly for a sec. Compared to the S6 display, the removal process is the same. Disconnect two ZIF connectors and unstick their cables. The S6 display here actually looks more complicated. Like you mentioned, it's connected at the top for the touch panel and the bottom for the OLED panel. And apart from that, it's got quite a bit more shielding. The Series 7 display is also quite a bit thicker, which contributes to that increased durability this watch offers. But if you actually look closer at the new Series 7 display, a lot of this thickness is coming from this added plastic frame around the exterior. Okay, so we were actually able to pretty cleanly separate the OLED panel and that plastic frame from the glass here. And what we found was you can see here completely separate OLED plus plastic frame and the glass itself actually has a redesigned geometry. It's flat on the back versus the previous Series 6 actually had a cavity on the inside yeah. which the display was laminated. And this likely increases the, the robustness because it's easier to machine off the back yeah, uh, and makes it less susceptible to cracking and probably cheaper to manufacture as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, another design change that adds complexity to this component, making it a likely candidate for the holdup. Moving on mm -hmm. from the display, removing the battery still requires some close quarters prying, but the adhesive is still mild enough that you can lift up the battery without deforming it. The smaller 41 millimeter battery still has a nice metal pouch to keep it safe. Both S7 batteries get a small watt hour increase from their S6 counterparts, though that doesn't translate to any increase in battery life here. I know this was after your time, but do you have any idea why only the smaller Apple Watches get this battery with the metal pouch? It's, it's likely that this metal pouch was a new technology that was introduced, uh, potentially allowing them to, to pack more energy density into a smaller form factor. Okay which may have been required because of the overall design constraints of the smaller watch. Yeah. And there was probably an increased price for, for this new technology. So they sprung for it on the smaller watch, but it didn't quite justify it on the larger model. I guess that makes sense. It's also great for disassembly, but I'm sure that's not what they were considering at <laughs> yeah. the time. Beyond the battery, the changes are small but impactful. Pulling the Taptic engine and speakers out requires less fiddling with tiny brackets, and it seems in general like the team took some time to rethink the way everything fits together in here. Notably, the speaker mesh is quite different from the Series 6. The old mesh looks tighter, like it would be more resistant to dust ingress, but the opposite is supposed to be true. Any thoughts on this device? Can you tell us how devices like this are sort of tested for ingress protection? It's, it's interesting. Really, it's the water tests, the water seal tests that drive the design and are the harshest tests yeah. for these devices. And because they're orders of magnitude more difficult to water seal than dust seal, yeah. that's really the deciding factor in most of these design decisions. And so I think the changes that we're seeing in the speaker uh, and the changes to the dust rating may just be some updates in how they actually document this uh, and not actually signify any serious design changes. That makes sense. Next out was the S7 package, which doesn't house a new processor, but might have something else interesting on the inside. One of the few external changes to this watch was the removal of the diagnostic port hidden in the watch band groove. The rumor is there's a new 60 gigahertz wireless module, probably hidden in this S7 package, that together with the proprietary dock, allows them to do wireless diagnostics. I'm actually shocked that they removed the only physical diagnostic port. On I'm the not watch. shocked. <laughs> This was, this was the one access point during both assembly, testing, 
to, to load on software and also to debug afterwards. So if it's so important, even during the assembly process, why do you think they removed it? I've, I've got a couple of thoughts. Uh, removing ingress points is, is always a plus. Yeah. Uh, I don't think this was the most critical one, but it's always a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, just removing overall assembly complexity, saving a little bit of space. Apple also has a pretty long history of testing technologies in the Apple Watch and then moving them over to iPhone. So this could be a sign of a portless iPhone coming soon. Finally, the sensor array pops free of the aluminum case. So Tobias, I know that this was part of your work at Apple. Can you tell us just maybe one or two interesting facts about this sensor array? I know that these things are super complicated. So maybe just, just go off. There's, there's a lot of fun stuff happening in the back sensor array here. Uh, a few of the most complex features, the ones that I remember most fondly, these four Fresnel lenses, which are housing the LEDs underneath, which shine out the light for the heart rate sensor. Yeah. These are actually doing double duty. The purpose here is not only to direct the light out to, to better optimize the light path, but also it's cosmetic. So it obscures the components underneath, which really, you know, it makes it stand out compared to some of the other wearables. Very the Apple. Market. Very <laughs> Apple. And in addition to the heart rate sensor, we've also got the ECG sensor built in here, mm -hmm. uh, both on the back and on the crown. And one of the really interesting uh, design constraints that we had was actually electrical signals from either wires in the wall or different different machinery it can actually couple in through the air into your body and gives very very low levels of noise during these ecg wow. readings <laughs> and so the proximity to some of this equipment had to be taken into account as as part of the design requirements and so how how did you design around that is that why there are two electrodes on the back there are multiple electrodes that allow for a certain path for that noise to be taken so it doesn't interfere with some of the other signals. Got it. Very cool. And that is a wrap on our disassembly. I am pretty impressed by all the changes that the design team has made to this display. And honestly, that seems like the only candidate to me for a reason for the delays. It's It's got to be the display with yeah. this completely new integrated touch into the OLED panel, the redesigned plastic frame around the outside, massive changes there and not a lot of other significant architectural changes. Yeah, and the end result might just seem like, oh, a slightly bigger display, but really having Tobias here has helped us understand that there are a lot of changes that go on behind the scenes to make a little change like that happen. So that's really cool. A huge thank you to Tobias for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. If anyone wants to learn more about Instrumental and the work they do to accelerate product development and save time and materials during the production of devices like these, you can visit the link in the video description or you can click the on-screen card right now. And we actually have a dedicated guide for engineering builds. It's the EVT, DVT, PVT white paper. Great name. <laughs> it goes in depth on what the causes are for these scheduled delays, best practices, and other engineering workflows. You can check that out in the description below as well. Before we leave, let's give this watch a score. Tobias, would you like to do the honors? Happily. This Apple Watch Series 7 earns a 6 out of 10 on the iFixit repairability score.